Onigashimas. Welcome back to the Goju Ryu Karate Center. So, uh, this morning I decided to answer a question from one of our commentators asking us to do a video on how to effectively strike pressure points. So, I'm going to start with uh, what you need to really deal with this topic. So, the first thing I'm going to do, Brian, please come in with the books. First thing you need to do is you need to study. Right, there is uh, a whole lot of ideas that should I hit a pressure point that it's going to nullify and stop my opponent very quickly, etc. Now, there are parts of the body that are very good striking points where when we hit them, we can do a fair amount of damage. However, if we look at what happens in MMA, if it was that easy, we would have a lot of injuries and a lot of fatalities in MMA because of the sheer number of these vital points in the body that would stop somebody in their tracks. We often get shown video clips of people trying pressure point, no touch, etc., and all of a sudden they get to face somebody who does MMA or grappling or boxing or even good old-fashioned karate, and they get a bit of a ass whipping. So, to start off with, if you wish to understand pressure points, first thing, Brian, I'm going to ask you to give me this book over here. Let's start with science, with what we know. Get hold of a good book on anatomy. In this case, I've got a copy of Grant's Atlas of Anatomy, and this goes hand and sock with another book called Grant's Dissector. And the Grant's Dissector actually is used by students who are doing dissection at university level, and that will help you understand where everything is located. All right? I did two years at university. I studied anatomy for two years as part of my degree, and um, it was not easy. Uh, second year was a whole year of dissection, so I know my way around the inside of a human body a little bit. I'm not going to say I'm on the same level as a thoracic specialist. I wish my thoracic specialist was here so he could help shed some light on the topic of pressure points, but unfortunately he has to run a medical practice. However, this is your starting point. So he has a good book. I'm just going to move this out the way, and the next thing you know, for some people, that might not be enough. So uh, here's my book that I used for second year anatomy. And because I was a sports uh, physical education specialist, what was interested, and I'm going to come forward, you can see all the little notes. Uh, does that come up, Sensei Zoe? All the little notes on muscles so that I could learn and no origin, insertion, and innovation of all the muscles in the body. It was required for my course. The most frequently used book in my dojo when we talk anatomy, believe it or not, is a coloring in book. <laughs> and um, again, just to highlight, I'm just going to try to find a page where that's how I used to study. There were all my extra notes on histology so that I could actually pass university. So with a good background in anatomy and having a, a place to start, after that, hold on Brian, let's have a look, you might find yourself interested in something like this, acupuncture, and this will now start deviating from the science and go towards oriental science, where are the meridians in the body? how do they run, etc. If you don't have a basic understanding of anatomy, this is not going to make any sense. You may want to search for books like this. There are a couple of people who have written books and extensive studies that have combined anatomy and the results of uh, some kind of scientific testing, hitting against force plates, etc., to work out the forces that are required to do damage. How fast does a punch travel? How fast does a kick travel? What is the penetrating ability of these uh, techniques, etc.? 
However, bearing in mind that the practitioner will make a, a difference to the actual technique, and um, they can only gauge to a certain point. So there are books available. There are several books available on this. And if you're more into uh, university level type study, you will go and look up journal articles, published articles by people who have done sports science and are trying to uh, put down a scientific explanation for the technique. Then, where most people find their study going, and I don't wish to belittle the authors in any way, I have these two books, I actually have several of their books, and the first one is the somewhat notorious and infamous George Dillman, and what's important is that it is a very common book. I do not necessarily agree with what he says and what he does, but I found the reading rather interesting. And then a much more uh, scientific approach in this book because they, they combine anatomy with what they're talking about. Okay. That said, when we've looked at those books, it might be more prudent and more beneficial to find books that have karate techniques and explanations like this particular book, which I bought, which is more of a shorter kan book. However, reading again, very interesting. And then, obviously, if you want to know anything about understanding pressure points, using them in a structured karate science way, there's only one person to look at if you're looking for books written in English, as far as I'm concerned, and that is Sensei Patrick McCarthy or Hunchy Patrick McCarthy. All right, we have, I think, three or four editions of Bubishi in our dojo for a very, very important reason. This is the science behind what we're doing, and it links directly to what you're doing in Qatar. Hi, Onyeshimas. So, my take on striking pressure points. If it's soft and it's vulnerable, you can use open hand techniques because they can penetrate a little bit easier. So, typically, nukite, nukite, right? These techniques are, are great because the eyes are organs. They're filled with nerves. The nerve endings run directly to the brain. They crisscross through the back of the skull, by the way, um, just behind the, 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 the frontal section of the skull. And it does affect the human body quite severely. And all you have to imagine is you're running, you're minding your own business, and a little midge, or what we call a mihi in South Africa, flies into your eye, and how immediately you have a response. The next thing would be the throw it, the trachea. Hitting, striking the trachea. So it's not really a pressure point, but it is a vital area in the human body. The next most common one, because I'm going from top to bottom, striking the groin. Now we know if you hit a person in these areas, we are going to get some kind of response quite often. More often than not, you're going to get some kind of response. Okay? Now, should we take, Brian, give us your hand, please. So, my favorite from when I was a child was, let's turn around, please, Brian. Shaking the hand is an understanding of the nerves that run in between the fingers, attacking the nerves using Ippon Ken, riding it like a motorbike, sticking it in there, and trying to grind away. Or attacking the pressure point here. This is often used by some people who say they're complaining about a headache. They grab on, they squeeze this little pressure point in between, and that's going to affect. You also get people talking about pushing on the arms, and in between here on the biceps, etc., that are trying to have some kind of effect. They want to press and it wants to create some kind of effect on the person. Now, right now, you can see Brian is shaking my hand. Brian is squeezing. I'm doing this. Nothing's happening. <laughs> this is a reality. I do this. Nothing is happening. I grab in here. Very little is happening. He thinks I'm tickling him. Okay? So, grabbing and pressing on these points is often shown, and everybody is like, wow. So if you're soft, it works. 
If you're a seasoned martial artist, it's nothing. You're trained, you're conditioned to absorb these blows. So, is there any point in dealing with those? No. Often we talk about pressure points on the chest, there's two above on the mid pec, and if you press, you'll feel, and it's not comfortable. And if you go down to the ribs where the floating ribs sit, and you press, it's not comfortable. Or the knockout point, it's a knockout point. From the lip, try and turn your head slightly, edge of your lip, down onto the edge of the door, and pressing over here. By the way, that is actually a small hole in the jaw where the nerve comes out that feeds and innovates the sensations in your mouth. So when you go to the dentist and the dentist gives you an injection, they inject into this nerve and it deadens your mouth and you wonder why it affects everything from here to here. It's because it actually, the uh, anesthetic affects this entire region, leaving you with that sagging mouth. So that is one of those points. That nerve runs obviously straight up into the brain. And eventually, if you get hit there, boom, supposedly you're going to get knocked out, KO'd most of the time. The reality is it's a very sore place. There's one on the lip, there's one on the nose, etc., etc. We're going to go and have a look at a chart just now that shows a lot of these points. So, thanks, Brian. So, Pareto Principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. Um, this is my interpretation. Oopsie. This is my interpretation of what the 80-20 rule is. 80% of people are hobbyists. And in your dojo, people who are coming in who are hobbyists come to karate, come to your martial arts center to train, to get away from the everyday life. They're doing it for fun, for enjoyment. They get great pleasure in doing karate. And because they make up the majority of your students, when you teach them, you need to be teaching according to what is going to make them happy to a degree, as well as challenge them enough that they're going to learn. Then if we take 20% of that and we decide, you know, not everybody is going to be a serious student. They're going to be layers to serious students. 16%, which is 80% of 20%, 16% would be your serious students. People who are going to train hard, they're going to be dedicated to the dojo, but they're going to have other aspects in their life. They're still going to have a day job. They're still going to work for a living. They're going to have families. They're going to be dedicated to more of uh, the social norms than a person who is a hardcore martial artist. Of that, maybe 4%, if we break that 4% down and we say 80% of that 4%, 3.2% are going to be that much more serious that they are going to make karate their livelihood. They're going to be the instructors, the teachers. They're going to put their dojo and their students ahead of their personal growth sometimes. So that's why I've got them as the next tier on my little list. And finally, just 0 0.8, 0.8% of those people who could be instructors, but who are so self-obsessed that they're not interested in teaching or sharing with other people, they are obsessed about becoming the ultimate fighter. Their dedication is towards the fighting art, the fighting science. They will be your serious martial artists who are predominantly combatants, fighters, people who will train eight hours a day. They will give up family time because it's not as important as training time, as fight time. So with that in mind, you've got to understand if we apply this principle and we're talking about striking pressure points and wanting to become so powerful that you can do it, well, you'd want to be in this last 20%. And the more you get down towards this last section, that's it. Now, dedicate yourself to hitting the makiwara for two to three hours a day. Then, it doesn't matter what you hit, you're probably going to break whatever it is because blunt force trauma is the optimal weapon of choice of a martial artist. Essentially, every time we hit or strike, we're using blunt force trauma to break, damage, or destroy that which we're hitting, whether it is hitting and breaking a bone, hitting and destroying an organ, or part of a system in the body. Attacking the throat is not really an organ. However, the throat does contain our breathing mechanism as well as our swallowing mechanism, our bronchial tube, as well as our esophagus. 
Okay, and in doing that kind of damage, we're going to definitely do something to a person that they're not going to want to get up. And again, it's hitting a person that hard, that effectively. So this is a breakdown for those people who'd like to do hardcore. Where do you find yourself if you're a hobbyist? Well, then you're going to have to find a shift in your mentality and try and move to something like this. And if you're obsessing about pressure points and understanding pressure points, then I'm going to suggest that you train extremely hard and in developing your power, your speed, as well as your strike force, your ability to hit. And not just with a regular fist. I have seen Japanese sensei hitting Makiwara with Ippon Ken or Nakadak. All right. We have seen people take their fingers and strike into sand until they no longer have fingernails because the fingers become calloused over the top, you lose your fingernails, and you basically end up with little stubby ends. The price you pay is an inability to do fine motor activities with your fingers. So there is a consequence. If you want to live in this bubble, there is a consequence. There is a very important reason why Higaona Sensei of the IOGKF practices calligraphy to co exist with the harshness of his regime that he's lived and that he's trained for, you know, he's now over 80 years old, so probably 65, 70 years. And this is to be respected. And the same thing could be said for many of the practitioners, Okinawan practitioners, the senseis, who are our forebears, who we look up to for guidance in our study of karate. Let's move to another side of the dojo. The lighting might not be so good. I'm going to swing this around. So in my dojo, there is one, and I'm just going to move to the other side, and two pictures. These pictures have come up a couple of times when we've done dojo tour, and what they actually are They're all the pressure points. You can see we've stuck a few stickers on places where we would like to highlight where techniques go. So how do you do this? Well, you follow maybe a Kionepon or Bunkai and you look for some ideas, left leg, back, Kamai. I'm gonna tweak the first two moves of Geeks at Itch and we're going to try and explain the pressure points behind it as well as how we might work around it. So Brian is punching Jordan. If I'm moving to the outside, I'm clearing his arm and I'm hitting to the back of the neck over here. There is a bone, the base of the skull, to which muscles, etc., attach, and you're trying to hit in there. Now, a normal fist doesn't get in there, so you might hit with an Ippon Ken to go in. Will it stop this person and make them collapse and, I don't know, but I do know it's going to be really, really sore. Or I could simply aim for the L of the jaw and try and hit and break the L of the jaw. In doing so, I'm going to affect, Brian, I'd just like you to turn your head, the ear, because where this mandible joins onto the skull at this point, it is in close proximity to the ear. I'm going to leave a person with a slightly deaf, and the ear helps govern balance. So by hitting there, you're going to have a problem there. I could be aiming for the neck. And again, instead of hitting, I might hit with this. Ibon Ken, and I'm attacking the blood system because running up through the back here would be the blood vessels that feed the brain. So we might be attacking blood vessels. So just there, there's a couple of ideas. I change my technique, maybe I use open hand, and it's a thumb in the eye, hand on the ear, palm strike to the ear to affect balance. So these are a couple of ideas that you could follow. Yes, on the zygomatic arch or the cheekbone over here, if I'm hitting, there is a pressure point supposedly over here because there's a nerve ending that runs through there, but it's just gonna hurt like crazy and cause the eye to swell. That's what you're doing. If you do any damage around the orbital, Brian, turn your head, look at the camera a little bit, if you do any damage around the orbital of the eye, the eye will swell and close. And that's just being on this side. 
If I tweak it slightly and I lift the arm up, what I do is I raise the rib cage, I soften the rib cage by hitting straight in. I don't get as much penetration by changing the technique to an uppercut, punching or a short punch. Urazuke, punching up, maybe I will do something interesting. Okay, it will be more painful. Am I gonna drop him with one blow? Probably not. If I hit in here, what's interesting is what lies behind this protective covering of bones and muscle. On this side of the body, we'll probably be hitting and attacking the pancreas and the spleen. The spleen is the more important of the two organs in terms of damage and combat. It is a reservoir of blood. And in damaging it, if you create internal bleeding, that person is gonna have a major problem. However, because it's protected by bone, it's really, really hard to deal with. Hi, right, Brian, change. Uh, attack with right side, please. So, Jordan Zuki again. So, if I'm on the inside, and um, I know for some schools, they don't like being on the inside as much because they've got to be vigilant, got to take account for this hand and this leg, then any technique that might come from there, but there is straight away into the throat. If you go over here between sternal notch and you attack here and you press down, it's not a very comfortable thing, but there's no way I'm gonna to say to you, well, I'll grab here and suppress this and it's gonna stop him. I do this, chances are he's gonna swat me in the head and smash me with this hand because it's ready, it's available. All right, we've got the sternal bone, rib cages. This is all designed to protect what's underneath it. We can, however, hit you. A lot of the time you see people talking about hitting the solar plexus. If you look at a person who's a seasoned martial artist, they will train and condition this part so they can take a massive amount of pressure, a massive amount of blows. Spleen, liver. Spleen, liver. Okay? Left hand, short punch into the body going upward. You're attacking the liver. Right hand, you're attacking their spleen. Hitting down, lower down, we're attacking the bladder. All right? And then obviously, kicking, kneeing, striking, we're attacking the genitalia. So there is a lot that is just basically not really pressure points, but attacking organs, attacking blood systems, attacking nervous systems. Submission by pressure. Oh, you, you're applying pressure on the back of the tricep. Yes, there is a point here. If I rub here, you can see Brian's face, he doesn't like it. But the more I do this and I'm trying to saw through his arm, the more likely he's going to turn and he's going to hit me. What's more important when you're here is the idea of that this is an arm with a lock on it. Every human being, generally speaking, has got a funny little bone that sticks out off the back here. And when that gets to this point, it doesn't go any further. So we know if we put the arm in this position, it's locked, I can now manipulate it. And so this is not pressure point as much as it is understanding the anatomy. If I'm doing this, I'm gonna create this kind of response. And therefore, we're gonna look at all the arm bars, etc., that come from this. This is basically a standing arm bar. All right, it could also be this, standing arm bar. Okay, so these are all these kind of points. In terms of, Brian, please grab on. I'm gonna do something very, very technical. It's a locking technique. Think about this movement in Seyunshin, the idea of being here and forcing him to sit by just revving the arm. All right, the science behind this is that when you bend his wrist like this, you're basically locking off the ligaments on this side by holding his hand here with the other hand, you're stopping his hand from sliding. And then by bending the arm here, any muscles that attach above the elbow are restricted. They cannot deal with rotation. And now what you're actually doing is you're rotating the arm from this side to this side down. And immediately you're gonna get some kind of response. And uh, is Brian in shot still? Brian's in, in shot, you can see he's not very happy. If I push this, he's going down. This has nothing to do with pressure points. This has got everything to do with understanding the structure of what's going on inside his arm. And for the exact same reason, techniques like the chicken wing or the figure four tend to work. 
So everything you see in grappling, where they tend to lock a limb, where they tend to pull across a ligament or a tendon, tends to work because it is getting a point in that tendon where it's at its maximum stretch and then applying force over the tendon or the ligament. And this is the science behind hurting somebody that is not necessarily attacking a pressure point. Okay? That point could be called a pressure point. Physiotherapists call them trigger points. So you've got a sore arm or a sore something and you go there and the physiotherapist presses or palpates and as they're doing this, what's happening is you're going, oh man, that's so sore. They are then going, okay, we palpated at X spot. That means that muscle is in distress. And then they can start treating that muscle. And this is how a medical practitioner, uh, what we call a physiotherapist in South Africa, in the United States, you call them physical therapists, um, how they would actually apply their anatomical studies in helping you recover. So obviously helping you recover can be used to our advantage as martial artists because it helps us understand how to hurt a person. So in terms of striking somebody on pressure points, striking effectively, by all means, if you are the 0.8 serious practitioner who happens to have spent a lot of time studying, extensive studying, anatomy, physiology, as well as spent a lot of time practicing striking with all different weapons against the makiwara into sand and into stones and you've got the absolute 100% physical package, then you're going to be able to do effective striking to pressure points. Me personally, I don't think it's a reality. I do believe that if you link a series of movements together, and I do believe that the cutters do link a series of points together that will hurt, that that pain will escalate over time or over a series of blows. However, I do think that it is leading you to a better, more safe, more secure place to carry on fighting from a tactical point of view. I don't want to stand in front and be holding and squeezing and trying to palpate or trying to apply pressure to a pressure point when that person can just simply smack me with the other hand. It's going to result in failure. However, if I understand how this works, how anatomy works, I can seek good points where I can apply simple basic karate to, instead of hitting a pressure point for the, po for the purpose of trying to drop the person, I'm hitting a pressure point to increase the pain that I inflict so I can create a better opportunity for walking away. This is ultimately the purpose of karate studies, is to fight against somebody who doesn't know that you have karate as a kit, or as a, a tool in your kit, or a tool in your toolbox, and suddenly they are confronted with somebody who has a little bit of physical ability and knowledge that gives you an opportunity to walk away. We're not talking about fighting in the octagon or in the square and it's two skilled martial artists against one another. That's a different world. And in that world, the fittest, the strongest, the best prepared and the person who has got the best game plan on the day is going to win. That's it. It's simple. All right. I don't subscribe to the view that one martial art is superior to other. I do subscribe to the view that we all need to be learning from one another. I'm a karate practitioner. I need to be studying with a boxer so I can understand a little bit of boxing force. I need to study with a grappler so I understand and I can do better grappling because there will come a time that I'll need to box, there'll come a time that I'll need to be able to grapple and there will come a time that I'm facing a grappler or a boxer or somebody who does Taekwondo or Krav Maga and I need to know how they operate. And that way I can study with them. And that's my, my final point on this. So this is a little bit of a uh, conversation more than an exhibition of my knowledge. But I hope that it is useful to the guys out there who are all very keen on pressure points. Please, if you've watched this far, don't send me messages asking for pressure points. I don't subscribe to it. Please go buy an anatomy book. Please go and join a seminar with uh, Hunchy McCarthy and go and study with somebody who is an exponent in this and that way you're going to get the best results. I can't give it to you. I'm just an instructor. Hi.
Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave comments. Last week's comments were fantastic. We had such an awesome debate on Super Rumpe Kata. Please go read them. Please go add your comments because it makes a huge difference to opening the dialogue on different karate viewpoints on our art because it is truly amazing and all the varieties make it absolutely beautiful. Have an awesome week. Sayonara.